All right, that's pretty fun. Does it look like fun to you guys? Yes, all right. So, well, I just want to start off. My name is Rick. I'm one of the pastors here. I want to welcome you guys all to church today. I hope you're having a great day. Um, that was monumental VBS is what that was, and VBS stands for Vacation Bible School, and we do that over the summers, uh, and we do it at our Joplin campus just because they got a huge space, and we got all kinds of room to do all kinds of stuff over there. Um, if you're new here today, I'd love to meet you. I'll be out in the lobby later after the service. Uh, just pop by, say hi. I'd love to get to know you. If you are new online, and you're just maybe your first time or even you've been there every week. If you would check in or say hi, I'd love to uh, reach out to you guys and, and welcome you. I know there's some people on there now that uh, have been watching for a long time, so thanks to you guys for being there as well. The, it, like, oh, also, if you're new, there, uh, Jana, I'm going to put her on the spot. She's probably not in the room right now, but she's typically at the front desk out there, and if you're new, we have a gift for you. We'd love for you to have that and just get to know you. Um, what else is going on? So, when I look at all those kids and those smiles, it made me think, do you know that, that children typically laugh 300 to 400 times a day? Isn't that cool? And it's kind of like you guys on Sunday when I'm up here preaching, right? So, <laughs> no, but actually, adults, they say, uh, you know, when you Google this stuff, I don't know where all that information comes. I'm just trusting everything on the internet's true, right? <laughs> they say that adults only laugh about 17 times a day. So it, at the very least, there's two out of the way for you guys, right? So you got two, you only got 15 more to go. But think about that, students and children and kids, 300 to 400 times a day they laugh or are trying to have some fun. And you can see from that video that it looked like they were having a lot of fun, and that's really important that we try to do that. And it kind of reminds me, in the, in the book of Matthew, it says this, Matthew 19, 13 through 15, and let me just read it to you. Many parents were bringing children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples felt this was a waste of time. They began rebuking those bringing their children. And apparently, the disciples had already forgotten what Jesus said earlier about the worth of children and the seriousness of causing them to fall. Jesus rebuked the disciples, telling them to let the little children come and not hinder them. The kingdom of heaven is not limited to adults who might be considered to be more worth more or to be I cannot read today to be worth more than children. Anyone who comes to the Lord in faith is a worthy subject for the kingdom. This implies that Jesus had time for all the children. He did not depart from the region until he had blessed them all. So kids are pretty important, I think. We should have just kept them in here today, but I I'm pretty boring to kids sometimes, I don't know. But uh, so in Monumental VBS, we had lots of fun. They, you know, it's, it's vacation Bible school, and we have games, and we have music, and snacks, and high fives, and all this kind of sciencey fun wow stuff that we do to get their attention and keep them engaged. And this past week, you know, we do this at VBS for the whole week. Right, And we try to do that, and we are doing that on Sunday mornings in our Kids Space program and in our youth group and all of these things, it's, and, and it's important, but I want you to know it's not all about entertainment, right? The little kids, sometimes, yeah, we got we to gotta get their attention and keep them engaged and, and do some crazy stuff, but we have a powerful purpose when it comes to each and every student, each and every kid, each and every child, your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews. What's at the heart of this is that we are helping kids experience the love of Christ. That's important, right? Our mission is to love like Jesus, right? We, we're, we have, our mission at this church is to lead people to an active faith in Jesus. And we spend a lot of time talking about that and how do we do that. We do that by loving like Jesus, and we want to show students and kids the love of Jesus. That's why we're here right? We are here to grow the kingdom of God, to grow the kingdom of God. It says in the Bible, right, that we are to go into this world and make disciples. What does that mean, make disciples? We need to teach them about Jesus, teach them everything that Jesus taught us, and then we're to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, right? And then I, I said this to the, to the volunteers and the staff this morning, that at the very end of that, it says that, and lo, I will be with you always. Jesus is going to be with us. God is going to be with us as we attempt this and as we work at, at making disciples. That's why we have the kids' space every Sunday. That's why we have youth group. That's why we have the Wednesday night stuff. 
And you know what? You guys are a very important part of that. All of you. Whether you volunteer there or you support it financially or, or you just support the church in general with your prayers and your presence and your gifts, you guys are monumental when it comes to our programs and the things that we do at this church, okay? I, we really don't have a huge staff here at, at, at St. Paul's CJ, right? I got myself, I got Jeremy, uh, Scott, who who's, by the way is in the hospital, is doing, doing better. I talked to his wife this morning, just FYI, um, hopefully get to come home today, right? We're looking at possibly um, maybe bringing back another part-time staff for kids space to help out over there because we found and we know and we understand that that is very important to, to the growth of our church, right? So we're going to invest in things that help us reach out into the community and make a difference because you guys are the hands and the heart and the feet of God when it comes to talking to kids and volunteering and teaching and, and do this, doing these things, and we couldn't do it without you. So why do we do what we do? Why do we do these things? Well, I believe it's worth the additional effort and, and the expense sometimes to, to, to engage the senses, trigger the emotions, and, and, and create that, those light bulb moments for students. And oh, by the way, as, and as I say students and I say kids a lot through this message today, I'm talking about you guys too, right? We're all students when it comes to learning to be a disciple of Christ. And we all need that excitement and those you know, emotional triggers and the things that, we, that will help us relate to God and relate to Jesus and be a part of his kingdom and his plan for our lives. So our role is to create experiences that will prepare people's heart for the Holy Spirit to do that transformational work. Methodist Church has a mission of, of, of leading people to an act of faith. That's, sorry, that's ours. Of, of, what is their mission? Oh my gosh, I, I should have wrote it. Forget I said that. But it's to do, to, for the transformation of the world. That's what I was trying to say. Right? We do all this stuff for the transformation of the world. So you may be wondering, how do we do that? Well, I try to keep it real, and as you can tell by, just by the way I speak, a lot of times it's very raw, very real, because I don't know what I'm saying up here, right? But the way we do it, there is a, a method and a madness to, and a process to this for every, everything that we use, and the acronym is REAL, and it's this filter that we use to, to craft the experiences for children and youth and, and every event that we have, and, and it's both not just a learning environment, but it's a ministry approach. Now, that R stands for to, to re relational. And what that means is, is it, it means that we need person-to-person -person contact, okay? And when I, when I think that personal contact, when you start to build a relationship with someone, a lot of times you see me pick on, on Eric over here because we've known each other for years, right? But we have that relationship. And you, you guys have those friends. You know I can say this to this guy, but I'm not going to say it to Pastor Rick, right? You, you have that relationship with people that, that you build on, and it, and it enhances our spiritual growth, and it builds our Christian friendship. So we want to be relational. And what we say is that we need to have at least five adults every Sunday interact with a student. And the best, that's the best way for a kid to know God is to know people who know God. That's part of the reason why I have them come in here in the mornings for the first part of church. To give, us an op for the, give them an opportunity to see what we do in here, but also to give us an opportunity to interact with the students. Okay, and I hope that when you're, you're over there, and, and not if, even if it's not your kid, but don't be weird about it, though, because I don't want to get anybody arrested, right? But say hi to these students and meet them and greet them and be nice to them. Show them the love of Christ. And the E stands for experiential. And we want to, to help them to have an experience, right? Because I believe that when we experience something through action and discussion, we remember it a lot better. Okay, it's like visual aids and things like that. But when it comes to kids and students, I mean, we're doing pies in the face, and I do fear factor games with the youth group and stuff like that. I'll just oh gosh, I shouldn't do it. I'm, okay, I'm going to stay on the notes. All right, I had a story there, but I'm not going to do it. Ask me about it later. It involves a blender and a Happy Meal. But um, so when they experience things, they really kind of hang on to the lesson or, or, the, or the point of the, of the stories, okay? We want to make it applicable. The aim of a Christian ministry is to equip people to be both hearers and doers of the word. We teach the kids that 
that giving back to help others shows that we're trying to become more and more like Christ. Because that's the goal, right? We are called all as disciples, as followers, as apprentices. What, you, you fill in the blank with that name, whatever makes you feel comfortable. But when we're trying to be like Christ, that's what we're trying to be. We're trying to be as real as we can when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. That's what it's about. And when we are real and when we are really experiencing Jesus, we have the ability to, to experience and teach and, and help students learn how to have a relationship with Jesus as well. And finally, the L, it's lifelong. Having these types of experiences can transform the heart and moving beyond a, a faith that is just inside these walls, right? And, and I've been there, and I know you guys have been there. You act one way here, and then as soon as you walk out, you act another way, right? Right? It's all about building this faith that goes beyond these walls, and it is an, an, an part of our lives. It's an inner thing that happens. It's an everyday occurrence for years and years to come. It's transformational. It changes people's lives. That's what it's about. So during Vacation Bible School, there, there's a Bible point for each day. And, and, and this is the interactive part with these students. And I want to tell you, like, day one was God loves you no matter what. Okay? And how many of you have volunteered at VBS and been a, vol- and, and been a part of VBS, right? And there are certain Bible points. When you say them, they say something else. The, the kids yell it back, and it is, God is awesome. So if I say the Bible point, you all yell, God is awesome, right? God loves you no matter what. I don't think they heard you online at all. Let's try that again, all right? God loves you no matter what. Yes, much better. That's experiential. And you may not remember a single thing other than Rick made me say God is awesome twice this week, but see what I mean? You'll remember that part, right? It's that experience. And they had different ones. So day two was God is with you everywhere. Yes. Day three was God is in charge. (laughs) Day four, God is stronger than anything. All right. Day five, God is surprising. That's right. That's monumental love. And you guys are like, God is awesome. That was only five days, right? Now, the kids learned a lot of stuff, and they have this interaction, and they're dancing around, and they're screaming, and, they, and, they're, and they're having fun with their friends. But there's also Bible stories. And, we, and, and, and the Bible story they talked about was the story of, of Jacob's family and how this family was full of conflict, and he had four different sons, and they were from four different mothers, and he had a favorite son, right? And he gave him this, uh, the coat of many colors. And Jacob gave Joseph, Joseph this special treatment. can imagine, it kind of reminds me of how my brothers and sisters feel because I was mom and dad's favorite, you know? <laughs> That's how it is for these guys, right? <laughs> so they start to get kind of upset with Joseph. They don't like Joseph. So yet God used this imperfect family to show his incredible intentional power and plans that he had for Joseph. Now, Jacob and Joseph, they, you know, with this coat and put the spotlight on him and, and the brother hates it. Well, then to top it all off, Joseph starts having these dreams and he tells his family about it. So I want to read you a part of that. This is from Genesis chapter 37. Joseph had a dream and it and told it to his brothers, which made them hate him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We, when we were binding stalks of grain in the field, my stock got up and stood upright while your stocks gathered around it and bowed down to my stock. And his brothers said to him, will you really be our king and rule over us? So they hated him even more because of the dreams that he had told them. Then Joseph had another dream and he described it to his brothers. I've just had a dream again, and this time the the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he described it to his father and his brothers, even his father scolded him and said to him, what kind of dreams you have that, that, that am I and your mother and your brother supposed to come and bow down to the ground in front of you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father took careful note of the matter. Thinking about that, as much as I like to kid that, that I'm mom and dad's favorite. What's mom and dad's favorite? And we know it's true, right? But I wouldn't rub it in my brother's faces, not from a stage on Facebook and, you know, the entire world watching, right? But think about that. And you guys, some of you may or may not know the rest of the story, but Joseph kind of has, a, as this goes on, they plot to kill him, his brothers do. They end up, they don't kill him. They throw him in a well and they sell him into slavery. And is there something about 20 shekels, which is about two years worth of uh, uh, pay at that time, but... And they sold him off instead. 
You know, so they were going to kill him, but the one brother says, no, 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 let's not kill him, let's just throw him in a well. That's even better. Then they go home with this fancy coat, and they put some, I think, goat blood on it and stuff like that. Look, mom, dad, or dad, he's dog. You know, like, wasn't our fault. We didn't know what happened. And they just play it off like he got killed by some animal. So, but God blesses him, right? If you know the rest of the story, he ends up in Egypt, and they all do come to him because of a famine, and he's in charge of the food, and they kind of have to bow down to him to get their food, right? It wasn't like he made that stuff up. He really was honored and favored. Now, there's another story that we learn about in Matthew, and the disciples want to know who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And this is what it says in the, in the Matthew 18 about that. It says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called the little child to him, and he placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. So Jesus is telling them what? He's telling them that you need to be more childlike not childish, right? I sometimes slip in between those two, just so you know. Um, it's kind of part of who I am. But, but Jesus wants the disciples to be more concerned about other people rather than, than themselves. And that's a pretty, pretty good message, a solid message for us some 2,000 years later, right? That we should be more concerned about others than ourselves. Yes, you got to take care of yourself and you got to be healthy and do the things right, but you are not the center of the world. Jesus is, and he calls us to go out into the world. And the world is the other people, not ourselves. So back to this question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Well, Jesus answers the disciples with a question using this child as a metaphor. And he says, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. That's pretty harsh, right? I gotta be, I gotta act, I'm good at acting like a kid. Just ask my wife, right? But I don't think that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the faith of a little child. He's talking about how, how children just will believe things, right? And it's our job as followers, as disciples of Christ, to set the right example for a child to believe in. There's a movie out there, and I forget the name of it, but this kid's talking about how you only have to have the faith of a mustard seed, the faith of a mustard seed. And they're like, oh, yeah, we'll move that mountain. And you can Google the clip. I watched it a bit. I can't show it on here. Facebook will shut us off. But he's like, it looked like he's using the force, and he's like, ah, and he's, you know, he's grunting, and, and they're all starting to laugh and tease the little boy. But then all of a sudden, the mountain starts to shake. The town starts to shake. Just the faith of a mustard seed. Now, the disciples must have kind of wondered, does Jesus want us to become helpless? Because in that day and age, children and women were almost like property, really, right? They had no vote. They couldn't say anything. It was the man who ran everything. So why would the disciples want to give up their hard-earned status? Doesn't us just committing to you, Jesus, make us even that much more elite? You got to think about that. When these guys are saying stuff like, well, is Jesus just like, really? Come on. Have you, not, have you met me, Right? I've been telling you this stuff my whole life. So Jesus clarifies the comment with this next verse, and, he's, and he also answers the original question. He says, whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So what Jesus is asking them to do is to change and be more like children, have the faith of a child, and to become humble. So we also got to explain things to kids during VBS. And when I think of explaining things to kids, I feel like I'm a kid at heart. And I know, and I'll just tell you, I'm, I'm what am I? I'm going to be 53 this year. I know some of you are older than me, some of you are younger than me, but to me, that's ancient, all right? Uh, but when I stand on this stage, I feel like a little kid because I'm learning and, and I have this excitement about reading scripture and studying and praying and, and, and trying to learn as much as I can. We all need to be like little kids and really want to understand and learn. So we explained to the, to the kids of VBS and, and for us that, that Joseph's family is messed up and, and, and weird as it was, this, the squabbles and kids tattling and parents disagree. And that stuff applies to us, right? In our lives, we have these same things. Things get messy. And it's good that God doesn't just wait for us to be perfect before he shares his love with us, right? 
Because sometimes even little kids think that they have to earn their friendship with somebody on the playground. Even in kids' space, I wonder, are they, are, are they acting different because there's maybe new kids in there or something, or, or they're new to the program and they have to act a certain way to be cool or whatever, right? To be the right kid. Maybe sometimes these kids have to, have to feel like they earn, have to earn that love at home. But to, today, we can reassure them that God loves them in spite of their faults. We can comfort them and help them to understand that God doesn't wait for us to be perfect God loves us and accepts us just the way we are. And that's why it's important for kids to know these things. And I think going back to the disciples, even kids, that, and, and us as adults, right, we have to learn to change, to be like children, to be, be, have the faith of a child. Well, how hard, have you ever tried, some of you have tried to quit smoking or try to quit drinking or try to quit cussing, try to quit whatever, right? All these bad habits that you acquire over the years. And, and, and some of us are lucky and can just decide one day, I'm not ever going to smoke again, and it happens. But others have to, the patch and the gum and whatever, all these things, right? Sometimes it's really, really hard to change a habit. It's really, really hard to change the way we think about things. When we, when we were little kids, we were taught this over and over and over and over. But the Bible is alive and changes and, and the world changes. And we start to, to, to get a, a greater understanding of what God's love is like. And then we have to fight against that urge to, oh, this is the way it was, but no, this is the way it is, right? You've heard it in Scripture where Jesus said, well, you've seen it or you've heard it said this way, but I am telling you this is how we do it now. Even Jesus changed things, right? Even Jesus told us there would be things that would be different over time. I'm sure all of us have gone through those things, but it's hard for us to, to, to put that time and effort into changing right? But think about that. When, when we have the responsibility of raising our children and, and going into the world and making disciples, how does that happen? We have to build relationships with people. We have to build relationships with children. We have to, to put the time and the effort in to do that. But that is really hard to do. And time is a really hot commodity for, for all of us, I'm sure, right? How many of you have, have one of these phones? And then if it's not on your little calendar, it doesn't happen. Or how many times do you look at your calendar and you're like, and this happens to me, Cons, oh, how come those two things overlap, <laughs> right? And it freaks me out. I'm getting messages. Look at that. I got to turn those notifications off. But we pack our schedule so full, and, and you know that if it's not on the calendar, it's not getting done. But Jesus, in, or in the Psalms, it tells us in Psalms 90, 12, verse 12, it says this, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. What does that mean when it comes to our, our children? What does that mean when it comes to our faith walk? There's, I got this jar up here, and everybody's going, oh, I'm going to guess the number. I'm I have no idea how many is in that jar right now, just so you know. But that is there to represent. There are 936 marbles in a jar. And by nine years old, for your child, your grandson, your granddaughter your nieces and your nephews, the little ones that you love so much, by nine years old, half of those 936 marbles are gone. And what those marbles represent are the weeks from birth until they graduate high school. From birth until... So let's just say that this is from age 10 to the rest of high school. That represents weeks, not years, weeks. Doesn't look so big anymore, does it? Doesn't look so big anymore. Now think about this. Imagine if I challenged all of you guys to go home and get your jar full of 936 marbles or whatever it is left over from you know, birth to, to high school. And then every week I want you to take a marble out and throw it in the trash. Every week, do that week after week after week. And that's a simple assignment. You could do it, right? You just got to go get you a big old jar and count out a bunch of marbles and throw it in there. But as you pull a marble out, you're remembering something. What's the point of doing this to, to see how much time you have left with your kids? Do I need to really put that much pressure on you to, to remember? If you are a parent or a grandparent, you might be thinking, that is stupid. I don't need any more pressure as it is, Pastor Rick, right? I don't have any more. So I would have to put that on my calendar to remember to do it, right? 
And maybe, okay, maybe there's a downside to counting the clock when it comes to these marbles, taking them out one by one, and it may cause a little depression in our lives, maybe a little guilt in our life, maybe a little anxiety in our lives as we get the marbles out. Maybe even a little excessive drinking or something. I don't know. But the good news is we have another choice. We can completely ignore the marbles. Just run through our day binge-watching Netflix in the evening. I'm, I'm guilty of that, Kathy, and I started a new series last night. Right? Watch five episodes out of ten already. That was over a couple days. I'll pass that out there. But still, how many hours have I wasted just watching Netflix and, you know, Maybe we can just pretend that our kids are never going to grow up, and we can just pretend that they'll stop you know, worrying about how you dress and give you a hard time. Maybe we can just pretend that, that they'll stop you know, eating kids' meals and, and ordering the, and wanting the Happy Meal for the toy and stuff like that. Maybe, we'll, maybe we could just pretend they won't start to become interested in dating and asking you for the keys to the car. Or maybe we can find a balance between the anxiety of of plucking those marbles out and to actually maybe a balance between the anxiety and the fear of wanting to deadbolt the door and never let them out of your sight kind of feeling, right? And then we have to start thinking, oh my gosh, do I have to make every second count? Does every second with my kid or my grandchild have to be that teachable, memorable, historic moment? Yeah. No, I'm kidding. Right? You're going to drive yourself crazy if you've got to journal that and keep doing this and keep doing that. But what if you decided to make history one week at a time? What if you decided to carve out just a little bit of time in your week and make that day important? Think about that. What if you made history one week at a time? What if you started acting like what you do weekly is more critical than what you do day to day? It's kind of like that country song by Trace Atkins uh, where he's talking to his daughter. It's called, I think it's called Just Fishing. Jeremy, can you come up and start strumming for me? I'm going to sing this part. <clears throat> I'm going to read it. All right? So, and here's how it kind of goes. And she thinks we're just fishing on the riverside, throwing back what we couldn't fry, drowning worms and killing time. Nothing too ambitious. She ain't even thinking about what's really going on right now. But I guarantee this memory is a big one, and she's thinking we're just fishing. It's all about making memories. That song, and as I read that, it reminded me of um, my, uh, my brother-in-law, Bill, Mary and Bill, some of you may know them. Um, he took me, it's in Ohio, and he had this pond, and I'd never really fished before, and he's trying to teach me how to fish. He throws it out there, and he says, okay, when you feel a nibble, give it a jerk, right? So I felt a nibble, and I gave it a jerk, and that fish went over my head and landed on the bank. Right? So I remember, I mean, I was like seven, eight years old when he did that. I remember that story and I remember his laugh when I did it. You know, he's making memories just about fishing. And that's why I'm his favorite brother in law to this day. <laughs> so the good news is, is you don't have to be some gifted singer or communicator or, or even some, you know, somebody fancy, or, you know, doctor whatever, or scientist this. You don't have to be, you know, a, I don't know. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to be special to make meaningful history with your family and your kids and your children. Any person can do it as long as they decide to show up. Just show up. Every week, week in and week out. He, Eric is like clockwork and Tim. They're there every Wednesday. Even if I don't show up, they're there every Wednesday. And some of you in kids' faith, like clockwork, over and over and over, you're there. Some of you are volunteering like crazy, and I appreciate it, and you're there every single week. And when you do that every single week, what's repeated week after week after week will begin to earn credit in someone's life. Now, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? I know that's kind of cliche, and I I actually asked Alexa, It's 400,000 days is how long it took to build Rome. And that's what history does. History accomplishes something over time. Doing it over and over and over. You know, I I wonder about Adam and Eve when when she was, you know, getting the apple and and Adam was standing right there, just FYI. He was standing right beside her when that happened. A lot of people want to think Adam was fishing or something and she showed up, but he was there. He was a part of it. God could have fixed that right then and there, couldn't he? If he wanted to, he could have just made the snake disappear, whatever. But he used time. He gave Abraham a son. 
And he let Joseph sit in jail. And he sent Moses to deliver a nation. And then he let a nation wander in the desert for decades. And have you ever wondered why? When God could just fix these things. It's as if God decided, I can help you understand something over time that you will never understand in a moment. And that means that what you do every week matters more if you keep doing it. Every week, week after week. And I want you to, I'm, going to tr- I'm going to read this to you, but I want you to remember this. We don't experience worth because we are loved once, but because we are loved by someone over time. We are not motivated by actions by one phase, but by words that move us over time. We don't understand the world through a single event but through a collection of stories over time. We don't know we belong because of an invitation to something, but because we have been welcomed in a tribe over time. We don't discover how to live in a moment, but we live when we experience the joys of a life over time. That's how that works. It's the experiences of a lifetime. And one of the things I think and I love the most is is, is fun. We got to have fun, and I, I mentioned the Happy Meal thing and all that. But it, it, it's we need to play for keeps, and I literally mean we need to play. You guys got to have some fun sometimes, and I know sometimes my body aches, and I get out there, and what's that say? My, my mind thinks I'm like 20 again, and my body's like, oh yeah, we'll show you, right? You'll be in a bed for a week. I still try. I'm, Eric and I, we're out there playing nine square with them. We're playing kickball with them. And then I go pop a bunch of pills and lay down in bed and my back's hurting, right? But we do it because I think I'm a kid, but we need to actually play. And when I say play, I mean play in the context of like play ball, play games, play make-believe, play hide-and-seek, play PlayStation, play cards, play act, play ground, and play dough. Simply stated, we need to play, right? We need to play. And I've been debating and debating whether I should kick this out into the audience, but I don't know. (laughs) Do it, all right? Don't break anything, but play. Have some fun, right? Okay, we got three sections. You got to share it, share it, share it. All right. For those of you online don't know, they're going to break a light any second. (laughs) All right. So that's enough play. All right. But we got to have some fun. All right. All right. We got to have some fun. We got to play. And what I want to know, or I want you to know, is that kids need to be seen, known, and loved. And everything we do in kid space and VBS and, and youth group and kick, not kickball, every time we have anything to do with children and you guys, I want you to feel seen, known, and loved. Right? That's important. And this, when we serve in youth and as parenting, this soul-loving care changes the world when we pour our hearts into it. Every time we pray for our kids or we have a conversation with them in our living rooms or in the car or at the dinner table. Now, while we don't make children believe in Christ, but we can, we can be Christ for them. We can live a Christ-like life for them. And we can be a part of drawing our kids' eyes up to the Lord. But first, our own eyes have to be up towards the Lord, don't they? No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. And I will raise them up at the last day. So moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, today I pray that you would look up to God. Look up to him for your help, for your strength, for your courage, for your commitment to serve. And I want you to truly know that God sees you. God knows you and God loves you. And for today, that's the good news. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, may you all continue to lead people to an act of faith. May you all continue to love like Jesus. Today we get the privilege and honor and opportunity to participate in one of the Methodist Church's holy sacraments. Okay, there's two holy sacraments in the Methodist Church, and one of them is baptism, which we're going to have some time to talk about that next year, and I plan on going down to the river and doing some of that. At baptisms at the river for those of you or anybody that hasn't been baptized. But today we're going to celebrate communion together. And one thing about communion that I love in, in our church or the Methodist church is that this is not a, a, a Methodist thing. This is not a Baptist thing. It's not a Christian thing. It's not a Catholic thing, right? Everyone is welcome. This is the Lord's table. And he invites all who believe in him. 
See, on the last night of Jesus' life, he got together with his disciples and he set them down for a meal and he tried to explain to them what was going to happen. He tried to tell them how his body was going to be broken. He sat down at that meal and he blessed the bread and, and he broke it and they shared the bread together. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Then a little bit later in that meal, they would have had this common cup that they would have passed around and drank, and it was wine. But we have um, juice in this, but he poured it out, and he blessed it, and, and, and they drank it, and he said, this is the, my blood poured out for you, for the sins of, of, of the many, right? And I love that part. I say this almost every time we do communion, is that many includes us. He's talking about everybody. He paid the price for your sins and your sins your sins, my sins. And I sin every day. Did you guys know that? We sin. None of us are perfect. For everyone has fallen short. Everyone has missed the mark of that perfection. That is why he came and lived a perfect life and died on that cross for us. So let me pray for us. Holy God, I just want to come to you today and I just ask and pray that you would bless our time. Bless these elements of juice and bread and and whatever anybody's using online, I pray for them as well, their water, their coffee, their crackers, whatever it is they're using, Lord, I pray that you make it something more than it is. God, I pray that you make this a time that draws us nearer and closer to you. Father, we ask, we pray this all in your son's most holy name. So what's going to happen, I'm going to walk down here and and Dorothy's going to come up and help. We're going to hand you a, a little chalice. That chalice has got juice and a wafer in it. Once everybody comes and gets it, and I'd like for you to come forward because what that means is that Jesus, no one took his life. He willingly gave it up for us, and that symbolizes that as well. There's a lot of symbolism in, in, in uh, communion in the Lord's table. And then once you get them, uh, go back to your seats, and then we'll, we'll take it together, okay?